Okay, great. So I'm going to demonstrate uh, a robotic-assisted MI, uh, MIS sacred lake joint fusion. Now, I, I don't know how many of you guys believe in SI joint fusions or not, or whether SI dysfunction is real on today. I, I do. I, I do think there's a certain proportion of patients who have back pain from SI joint dysfunction, and I do think a fusion can be helpful. Now, the hardest part is picking the right patient, just, just like everything we do. So patient selection is crucial. But in the right patient, I think it could be a benefit. And if you're going to do an SI joint fusion, utilizing a robot is the best application. You know, we, we've talked about robotics, the value, um, what, you know, what the future of robotics is. But I can tell you that the current generation of robots and SI joint fusion is like a perfect combination. You know, I've demonstrated I don't have to wear lead. It's a very quick operation. In fact, the hardest part is planning, particularly if you, you don't understand anatomy very well, which I find it challenging. The three-dimensional anatomy of the pelvis is, uh, is, is somewhat confusing. And I, I've been um, uh, you know, treating it, operating on it for, for a number of years, and it still uh, takes me a little while to think through the process. So um, I'm going to demonstrate uh, an SI joint fusion planning on the robotic system. And then, I'm sorry. Um, hey. Abe, Abe um, I apologize, Abe. No, okay. um, Abe is going to demonstrate doing the fusion. You can see that it, it is a very straightforward operation. Once we plan it, it'll be a 10-minute operation, skin to skin. And, and again, I'm going to highlight uh, the fact that the robot is your best uh, uh, tool in doing that. So here's a typical um, planning station screen we, uh, we have after uh, registering the, uh, the pre-op CT. And so this is what you see on a planning station. So we have uh, a synthetic lateral view, and then our trajectory views here. So we're just going to drag a screw, uh, the first sacroiliac joint screw here. Oh, no. So, so this was already planned, and you just drag the screw to where you want it, and this has been already dragged. Can I get rid of this so I could redrag it? Uh, Uh, whatever. So I, I'm going to just, as you can see, we're just going to, uh, I dragged it too far, huh? Okay. As you can see, you just can drag it to where you want it to. And the planning is where I find it can be a little bit of a challenge here. So this is our first. Paul, Paul would you mind uh, letting us know what you what you're looking for and what your strategy is to place uh, for for planning? That'd be great as you as you go right now. What are you uh, looking for? Uh, I'm sorry, Christoph, I, I missed that. Uh, so he was asking. Oh, would you mind go go through how you what you're doing right now? So he's like, what's your thought process? Why are you going between the two? So he's he's asking about that. I see. So so the first screw I, for people who don't do SI joint fusions, typically we try to place three screws. And the classic teaching utilizing fluoroscopy is you want to plan the screws in such a way it doesn't enter the pelvis because the uh, L5 nerve root is resting right on the SI joint uh, as it exits the foramen. So one of the risks with an SI joint fusion is if you're too ventral, you could actually injure the L5 nerve root. And I have actually seen um, uh, a patient who had a foot drop after an SI joint fusion that went wrong because the screw was placed too ventral. So one of the key tenets, if you're doing a fluoroscopic-based SI fusion and you're looking at this lateral view, is you want the screw placed uh, uh, or trajectory into the probably the lower uh, S1 vertebral body. And you do not want it ventral. And that uh, entails a lot of fluoroscopy in terms of positioning a patient just correctly, then using K-wires uh, to plan the screw uh, trajectory in your incisions. It's just... Uh, 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 quite amount uh, of fluoroscopy, which you can avoid utilizing this robotic system. And so my first screw plan, as you can see, is uh, has a trajectory toward the SI joint. I don't know if you can see this cortical line, but that, that represents sort of the SI joint um, or, or uh, a line that represents the ventral pelvis, and you, you do not want to be above that. And so you can see this initial screw plan here, and because we have the benefit of a three-dimensional view, I've placed it here on the upper sacrum. You can see here's the ileum, sacroiliac joint, and, and then the sacrum, but this is the upper sacrum. This is upside down, actually, if you want to call it. So right here. See that? 
is a 12 millimeter diameter screw. So that, that is a reasonable uh, positioning for this screw. And you can see that this, the implant we're gonna use has a hollow center, and I'm lining up this hollow center where the bone graft will uh, be placed so it crosses the SI joint here, okay? So that's the first screw. Now, once you've placed your first screw, it's very easy to place your second screw. Now, again, I, I'm just gonna drag the screw. I'm gonna turn it around. So there's different ways of planning this. I'm gonna move the screw in the position here. And you could, this is, the screw's way too long, so I'm gonna shorten it to 45. And here. Just for spacing purposes, now I could see both screws here. There's a first screw, here's a second screw. So Dr. Park, for that second screw, do you get that close to the foramen? Or do you, uh, like, is that? What do you mean by close to the uh, like, Because it's, it's uh, like, would you put a 40 or would you do a 45 uh, well, in real life? You know, you, you know, if you trust navigation, you know, we don't, uh, this, uh, this ends right next to the foramen, it doesn't violate it. Now, if, if you're paranoid about it, you could use a 40. That, that's the value of planning, right? So. We could try to bury this head, but you know this has a cap on it, this particular screw, so you're not gonna be able to drive it farther than this, uh, I don't know if this projects well, but this bottom portion of the prong. So I think 45 is actually better because we're not gonna be able to drive it that deep. And that makes it safe and we're spanning the SI joint. Now, the nice thing about three-dimensional planning is you can see the SI joint's diastased here. And you know when you're using fluoroscopic-based uh, uh, guidance, you can't actually see the spacing on the SI joint. So sometimes, you know, if you get a post-procedure post CT, the screw crosses the SI joint where it's, there's a wide gap. And I think the likelihood of fusion is probably lower there. So, you know, by virtue of having 3D uh, planning capability, I could actually position this somewhere else. I'm not going to because I, if I want to put a third screw, it'll crowd it. But if I want to do, I, I could move this down to here where it's crossing the SI joint where it's much smaller. But instead of doing that, I'm just going to put this screw here and then just plant a third screw. So here's a third screw, I'm gonna just put it here. Ah, this won't let me turn. I'm gonna, now this one I'm gonna make much shorter. I'm just gonna put it here. And you can see I'm crossing that side joint with the graph window exactly where I wanna be. And I'm, I'm looking at all the dimensions here. Now, it, here on this synthetic lateral, it looks like I'm too ventral, but 3D guidance suggests I'm not, but I could, I could raise it up and change the trajectory a little. This is the, the value of having um, the capability of planning in three dimensions here. And then this follows a screw from the beginning as it crosses the SI joint to the tip, and it looks like I'm in good position here in the sacrum. And I could do that with every screw. Now, I'm just seeing if this lines up okay here. And I want to see all three screws now in position. Hey, um, Reed, which is the to see all three uh, screws in position? I forget which one that is. Actually, can you get rid uh, okay. It's fine. So I'm going to look at this. So they're, as you can see, they're not all parallel. And that's because I, I planned them individually. But if I wanted to line them up, I, I could. So if I go to the first plan, I could shift the position so it lined up closer to my other screws. See, so now they look like they're in parallel. And I could go to my third plan for the same thing. Dr. Park, while you're showing us this, what are your thoughts about pre-op CT versus intra-op CT for SI joint fusion? 
Oh, and what do you use? Oh, I, I use interop because we have uh, capability. We have an ORM, so it's just easier. But he, he, as you can see, I plan out the, all three screws here. And th this is actually the longest part of the operation. And I'm just trying to make them parallel. I don't have to make it parallel. But I just, I just want to show that you can make all the trajectories parallel like you typically see in a fluoroscopic um, sort of place uh, SI fusion. But we're, we're, we don't have, we're not bounded by that because we have th three-dimensional imaging and planning capability. So you can actually plan the screws to cross SI joint right where it's close, you know, right, right where there's not a big gap. And I think the fusion rate will be higher there. So that's a potential value add of user, utilizing a robotic planning system. But now that we've planned the three screws, it's very straightforward now. So this is the first screw plan. I'm going to go to the navigate screen. I'm just going to the first position. We're going to just mark the skin here. I'm just going to score it. So on the skin, it went to the first position. Now I'm going to go to the third position here. And this is very straightforward. And we're just going to connect the dots here. And where is it? Do you have a marking pen, Reed? Or a little bit easier. So I'm just going to mark the incision just by going on a screw plan. So this is going to move to the first screw plan. We don't have a no marker. Huh? It just does not appear so. Not a big deal. I'm just, I'm just going to score it. We'll go to the, the third plan. That'll demarker our boundaries on our... I think you're in the way of the camera. Oh, so I went to the first screw plan. Now I'm going to the third screw plan. That'll mark the boundaries of our skin incision, which will be about an inch, inch and a half, typically. And then we could just time how quickly this is going to go. It's going to go very rapidly. So, all right. So I, those are our two points. Remove this out of the way. And you basically just have to make an incision here. Abe, just make an incision between those two points. You can just go all the way through. So once you make an incision, we're just going to dissect through the uh, subcutaneous fat there. Oh, here, let me just grab that. So I, I typically just use a bovie, and you know, there, you're not going to really get to the muscles where you can see it, but I just kind of use a bovie and get through the fat, because there's a, like a scarpa type layer here that can resist screw placement. Then once you have that, we'll just go to the first screw plan, and go ahead and step on the pedal there, Abe. And this is going to be as simple as a two-step process now. We're going to drill and then place the screw. Yep, it's going to go through the skin a little. Yep. All right. Okay. It's, it's not quite green yet, so keep, keep, keep your going. So I'm not going to even be involved here. OK. So two-step process. I'm going to hold some pressure. He's not, this patient's not on a, a Jackson frame, so it just needs a little counter pressure here. But he's going to draw a track now based on his first screw plan. I don't know if you can see the screen very well. So. Here, you got to see it. Okay, just drill it. So he's drilling through the first screw track. Now, this is a rigid guide. Yep. Yeah, it's, it, you got to push hard. Good. Okay. Now push hard through the SI joint. There's cortical bone there. Good. Okay, good. Now I bring it out. Now I'll take the screw. This is how simple it is to do an SI fusion. So literally, it'll be a minute of screw. So this screw, um, show, show the implant. Actually, as you can see, there is, um, oh, this isn't the exact screw. So this, you see, has a hollow um, window for fusion. That's what we were planning uh, for this across SI joint. Okay. Now you can put the screw in. Uh, Dutch Park, what do you fill that with usually? What, what did you say? Uh, what do you fill the screw with usually? Uh, allograft. Bone's hard. Yeah. You, you know, this is 12 millimeter, right? That's why. You know, I, we use, I, do you have a 10 at all? You, you could take it out. 
We use a bigger screw here than, to, can you reverse it? Yeah, trying to. We, we ended up put using a, a bigger diameter screw than the drill. Might have to just use a driver. You take it off. It's just take it off here. We can just take, put a T handle on and okay. screw it. Yeah, so uh, I don't know why, but we use a 12, you you, is a, there a T handle? A T? So we ended up using a 12 millimeter screw rather than a 10. So it's much bigger than the actual um, drill track. That's why we're having some trouble. Because across the SA joint, there's a lot of cortical bone there. So we should have just used a 10 millimeter. Oh. Oh, well. It came off the screw. It's still in there, though. It's still in there. We'll go to the next. Next one down, I guess. Yeah, we'll go to the next one down. So, so uh, unfortunately, the bone's too hard for us. That we didn't, the track's not big enough. But let's we'll move to the next one. But you can see how simple this is. I draw the track there. We'll, we'll be successful with this one. <laughs> it's just that we use the too too big a diameter screw. The problem. Uh, can you put on? High speed, that's on the low torque. Okay. All right. Push it a little harder to get through. Good. Great, that's good. Pull it out. Okay, now we'll take the regular 10 millimeter rather than the. Uh, so I personally have never used a 12 millimeter diameter. I'm, I'm not sure why we loaded it because if you look at the drill that we use, it's much smaller than even 10 millimeters. Okay, so this is a 10 millimeter diameter SI joint screw and you, you'll see, go ahead. It works, see how nicely it works? Great, okay, we're in good position. One. Mm -hmm. That's how the first one should have gone. Really easy two step process there. And then we'll go to the third plan now. So you can see how quick this is. See, no fluoroscopy, just, yeah. uh, just drilling a track, followed by a screw. Yep, that's perfect. It's hard cortical bone here. Very hard bone. Yeah. Uncommon for a cadaver. Yeah, if we were using a jam sheet in a K-wire, this would be a real painful operation too, which is what you t traditionally do with fluoroscopy. Good. Take that other screw. And good. So that that, that uh, as you can see, we dropped the last two screws in several minutes here. It does not take very long. Okay. Um, I don't know. Let's just take a fluoroscopy, fluoroscopic view. I mean, what what it's going to show is like our first screw is a little. It's going to be proud because it's just too hard to turn. Yeah. The bone's too hard and screw track. Is, wasn't drilled to the right diameter, but I, the other screw should be okay. So the, my, my typical practice, I use a robot, so I don't take the first fluoroscopic view we take, if everything looks, again, you, you always wanna make sure image guidance seems like it's working correctly, but if, if everything looks pretty uh, straightforward, then this will be your first view after all three screws are in. So there's no real reason to wear lead, and we're not exposing ourselves to radiation. Maybe get a lateral. <laughs> I don't know why it doesn't see anything. Hey, Paul. Yes? It's Neil. Now, I, I, honestly, I think this robot's been amazing for SI fixation. It's really changed the workflow and the paradigm. Now, I've used it a lot and totally switched to the robot. What's even more amazing, and I don't know if you've done this, we've done many sacral fractures now. H fractures and U fractures fix the fracture with the robot. It's amazing. You can put a screw right through it. 
The robot right. makes it much easier, and you don't need any of this flow anymore. Yeah, it, it, so it's it's actually the robot's been very useful there. Yeah, it's the best application for the the sacral. Yeah, I've run quite a bit. I've run about four sacral fractures now. I mean, something that you know, I just you know just take more X-rays otherwise. I don't know why we can't get a actually a fluoroscopic image. Our fluoroscope is kind of on the fritz. Yeah, those are virtual screws. Remember, there's nothing there. Okay. You can see all the screws are just like what we planned. Cool. It's just, uh, unfortunately, the first screw is, uh, again, we you chose a diameter that's probably too big for the screw track and the bone's too hard. So uh, if you get an AP, that somehow that'd be great. So Paul, you have this, let me ask you another question. What do you think of the other trajectory that goes from the PSIS down? You've seen uh, that? It, I think it's called. Uh, I'm sorry. Well, I, this New York. is the trajectory for fixing the SI joint. You go from posterior, from the PSIS, you go down to the joint. <clears throat> from the PSIS region. I think, um, I think Medtronic's markets, I don't want to give a company name. It's called Rialto or something. And you pass the screw from the back to the front. Rather than going lateral right. and through the gluteal muscle. Right. Oh, right. Go, like Rialto? Yeah, Rialto, exactly. Yeah, I, I've done Rialto a couple of right. times. Yeah, I, I think in some ways it's it's probably a better way of getting... Me too. I've started liking it. That's why I asked. Because I've had a few gluteal hematomas through that muscle. Uh, I did, I had, one definitely had a bruising there in the muscle. Yeah, no, I, not, it's not just the muscle. I, I think, like, when you think about it, we're, we're, we're traversing the SI joint, and the diameter of the screws are only 10 millimeters. Right. I don't think there's that much... The fusion potential is not great. Mm -hmm. Whereas Rialto actually spans, uh, you know, if you get it just in line with the SI joint, um, it's like an interference fit. It crosses more of the SI joint. So I think fusion, in some ways, is more likely. I think so. I also think it's along the line of weight-bearing. It, it's kind of along the axis. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I... In trajectory. Yeah, I, I think there's pros and cons, obviously, with mm -hmm. either technique. I mean, this gives a better um, uh, compression. Is yeah. that a radio loosened table? Maybe that's why. It must be. I don't know. We can't seem to get an AP. It's no, we believe enough. you. It's okay. <laughs> okay. But, uh, I, you know, I, I guess we're stuck with the lateral. But uh, as you can see, it's a very straightforward uh, procedure with the robot. Yeah, it looks good. Okay. Any other no. questions? No, we're good, man. Hey, uh, Paul, one quick question. Um, yeah. And uh, you might not hear me very well, but you know, in addition to the clinical workup of these patients, do you off, do you typically do a, a diagnostic block for them before you offer them a fusion surgery, or what is your what is your workup before you go ahead and really fuse a, a patient to the SI joint fusion? Yeah, so um, that's a good question about the workup. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I, you know, the typical workup is they have to have the uh, three or five physical you know, findings for SI joint dysfunction, a typical history, sort of not, not midline back pain, but lower, sort of upper buttock, you know, focal back pain, and it has to lateralize. They can have a component of leg pain. And uh, again, there's physical uh, exam findings that we do look for, and if they have three or five, then they get referred for a diagnostic injection. If they respond to a diagnostic injection, I, I would say 50% pain relief or more, uh, but insurance companies nowadays are asking for 75%, even up to 90%, depending on the insurance company. Then, you know, they get diagnosed, they will have the diagnosis of SI joint dysfunction. Then, it, for me, it's conservative management, and that's physical therapy, um, more injection therapy, radio frequency ablation, they have to fail all that, and they have to be reasonable patients. And I work with a pain physician who uh, is really interested in SI joint uh, pain. So he'll, he'll put each patient through all these conservative measures. And if he deems you know, uh, the patient an appropriate candidate, then he'll refer that patient to me for a fusion. And I'll talk to him. I, I won't guarantee success with it. You know, if you look at the literature, and again, a lot of it's sponsored uh, uh, literature, the success rate is about 80%, so it's still not 100%. Um, so I, I'm very clear cut with them that they may or may not respond to it. And um, so that amounts to me doing, and I look at our data, I do about five to 10 a year. Actually, I don't even think I hit 10, maybe eight. 
So I, I don't do a huge yeah. volume of it. But for the patients I have done, I think some have been successful for sure. And do you ever see loosening of the screws? I mean, I know that the new technologies have these bone windows and stuff, but but have you seen patients that are doing okay until the screws loosen and then they just, uh, you know, become symptomatic again? And what is your strategy for when that happens? I mean, what's your what's your backup strategy? Yes, uh, the answer is yes. I, I've seen uh, patients have recurrent pain with loosening. That's apparent on CT. And again, that goes to what Neil suggested. That, you know, sometimes these screws, as they cross the SI joint, the, the amount of fusion that you uh, obtain is just where the screw is. And sometimes it's not robust, and so the screws will develop some lucency, and, and patients can have pain. And what I've done is a, more of a Rialto technique, in, in fact, um, is do more of an open operation, and I'll do a, a, a screw fixation, uh, followed by more, uh, you know, I've actually implanted Rialto um, just in line, and that's where navigation is very helpful because you, you are, you're going to have screws uh, from your prior operation. Um, you can take them out. I mean, utilizing navigation, you could actually take out the screws um, and then try to redo the fusion. But that gets more involved, uh, actually, because I, I don't want to keep putting screws laterally. I mean, your, your uh, um, uh, remaining bone is just not robust enough. So, um, like, uh, utilizing a, a different approach, uh, whether it's Rialto, which is uh, more of an inside-outside inside outside technique uh, or um, placing a screw like your typical S2ALR seems more reasonable.